There should be a handout um, on those chairs. We are in our second week of our study on the Westminster Standards. We're looking in particular at the Confession of Faith. So the Standards is going to be the Confession of Faith, big tome, substantive summary of Scripture's teaching, right? It's not equal to Scripture as we learned last week, but subordinate to norm by Scripture. Um, there's also a larger and a shorter catechism. So I want to pray here in just a moment. But what we're going to look at, uh, God the Holy Trinity here in chapter 2. God, there's a lot of different views on whether God exists or not, or if so, what kind of God is this God? Um, we're going to look at God's attributes. And there tends to be two kind of categories of God's attributes. They make distinctions, at least theologians have throughout the history of the church, incommunicable attributes and then communicable. We'll look into those a little bit. And then we're going to get into the Trinity. And what we want to look at are um, these um, processions, um, these relations within the Godhead, and then a little bit on missions of the Trinity. Uh, Father sends, the Son and the Spirit are sent, right? Son from the Father, Spirit from the Father and the Son. So, We've touched on that a little bit over uh, earlier in the summer, but let's begin in prayer. But first, just a quick word, uh, this amazing verse from 1 Timothy. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And then we go back to the um, very beginning of John's gospel um, for this, this, this verse here in John 1.18. <clears throat> no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. Let us pray. Our Father and God, You, you are the King, uh, eternal, immortal, invisible. Um, we have not seen You in Your divine essence, and yet You make Yourself known to us um, by sending Your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in the flesh. We thank You. Uh, for our Savior, we thank You that He makes You known to us and, and certainly uh, us known to ourselves. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the rich history of your church that has reflected and, and tried to love you with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength and has written so much. Thank you for this confession of faith. Help us to reflect upon all that it's saying about you in, in light of what your word reveals. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, great line real quick as we begin here. You have the confession before you. We'll just kind of work through that a little bit. Um, Stephen Charnock, weird name, great Puritan. Listen to, listen to what he says here as we, as we look at this, um, this first line in the confession. There is but one only living and true God who is infinite in being and perfection, a most pure spirit, invisible without body, parts, or passions, immutable, immense, eternal. And then you have this language here, in comprehensible, right? Okay, so why do we even begin in trying to comprehend God? Well, because He's revealed Himself to us. And Charnock says, though we cannot comprehend Him, referring to God as He is, we must be careful not to fancy Him to be what He is not. It's a great line. You catch what He's, what he's uh, concerned with. Though we cannot comprehend Him as He is, we must be careful not to fancy Him to be what He is not. So let's have a discussion. I know it's early. Um, What's Charnock concerned about? Two things, right? Though we cannot comprehend him as he is, we must be careful not to fancy him to be what he is not. He's concerned about idolatry, isn't he? Right? But he's also concerned about, um, in a sense, some rationalism. Because God is utterly incomprehensible. So you have, you have a couple concerns. One is the, the idolatry to make God into something that he's not. The other one is just to rationally assume you can know God exhaustively. So if both of those are wrong, even though we just confessed our scripture, or our scripture, woe to me, right? God's incomprehensible according to the confession. Charnock's guarding against that, that we comp can't comprehend him as he is. How, how do we even begin to get our coordinates? Let's discuss this as a class. I, I, how do we get our coordinates for even understanding who, who God is? If we can't know him exhaustively and we want to avoid, okay, holding up a Bible, Okay, the word. Good. Um, creation. Creation. Good. Go ahead, Barry. Conscience. Conscience. Yeah, in a, in a sense. Now, there's 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 certain views of God. We think of um, all these wild views of God. 
polytheism. We have pantheism. Deism. Sorry, I'm just going to put these on the board, okay? And then we have also atheism. Okay. These are all ways to get God wrong. Okay, what are those fancy words, Pastor? Right? Okay. Polytheism, belief in how many gods? Many. Many. Yeah, very good. And of course, the confession says there is but one only living and true God, right? I am He, there is no other, right? You thought I was altogether like you, like the Psalms, Isaiah, are filled with these rebukes that God is not like these other gods. All the other gods of the nations are but idols. Pantheism, th these are somewhat popular views, pan and theism and pantheism. God in, in everything, when you think of all is divine, pan and pantheism, that runs afoul of one of the greatest distinctions in theology, pantheism. What is that great distinction? Creator. Very good, yeah. Creator and creature. That's a, a really important distinction. And remember, Charnock's concerned. He says, though we cannot comprehend him as he is, right? he's, he's maintaining that creator-creature distinction. We can't know God exhaustively. We can't know him exhaustively or comprehend him uh, completely in his essence. But we can comprehend and know what he's accommodated to reveal to us. And so this panentheism, very popular today, God in, God and pan, everything, right? Again, that, that's basically every, all is divinity. The divine and, and worldly principles are mutually dependent. A lot of the contemporary theology on offer, not a lot of it, some of it, is, has a very panentheistic bent to it. The, the word that these really uh, wise theologians, his name's James Dozel, he's written a couple books on God and divine simplicity, which seems almost like, who has time for that? He calls it theistic mutualism. And, and what, that, what that says, and we'll get into this a little bit more, is that God um, is God, but then he, he, he kind of accommodates himself and then limits himself or is truly himself to enter into these lovingly relationships of reciprocity and change. Does that make sense? Sounds like us, doesn't it? Well, God's like that too, because he can't be truly loving unless he does that. And so that's kind of phony baloney. And the confession, our confession guards against that uh, to the bone. But a lot of contemporary theology, unfortunately, um, not polytheistic, not pantheistic, because they argue for the creator-creature distinction, but very panentheism. Uh, deism is God is out there, not directly involved in the world. And then atheism of, is, of course, anyone know what that one means? No God. Yeah, no God. Now, I've made this point throughout the years. Even though no God and God in everything, they seem like opposite ends of the spectrum, don't they? I mean, God is in everything, no creator-creature creator, creature distinction, Atheism, God doesn't exist. What do they have in common? Well, they're both denying the true God. Okay, that's in common. But what, what they both fail to allow for is an external word of judgment or grace. You must see that. Like a lot of these, these worldviews won't allow for an external word of judgment. If God is in everything, you, you often see this in contemporary spiritualities. How is the truth found, class? with these kind of worldviews. Maybe, this is a little reductionistic, okay, but I'm teaching a class often found by looking within. And then you, you, come to your, uh, you come to God when you truly come to yourself by some inner sense or inner experience or inner vision or inner light. Does that make sense? Because if God's in everything, well, let me just move out of the fray of this, that, and the other thing, and then I can encounter the divine. Go ahead, Larry. It's a, I'm, I'm completely stumped. That's a great point. I, I think what these common worldviews have is a word of judgment and grace. They wouldn't, wouldn't use those terms, right? But judgment, well, I'm my own judge and captain and grace. Well, I don't really need it or I find it when I come to myself or when you help me get it. Like They're, they're going to... They're gonna, um, bastardize is probably a bad Sunday school word. 
right? Christian theology or worldviews are going to tend to borrow from that and then put a real funky spin on it. So the judgment would be in a very secular, therapeutic, pragmatic worldview, right? We talked about that. Secularism, religion under the conditions of secularization. It goes from what? Well, have your own gods, right? To what? Well, that's true for you. This is true for me. Relativism, right? You get pluralism. Everyone has their own gods. Well, that's true for you. It's true for me. Then you get to relativism because like, who are you to judge what's true for me? And then after relativism, what, what do you have at that point? Well, what's true for me is what works for me. Pragmatism. And then what works for me really ultimately is going to make me what? Happy, exactly. Very uh, psychologized views of religion. Very therapeutic. Okay, And so in that type of worldview or that religious worldview under the conditions of secularization, we're talking divorce from Scripture, though sometimes this can creep into the church. Grace or salvation would be happiness, right? And of course, judgment or curse would be anyone who's killing my vibe on the way to discover myself and be actualized. Do you follow that, right? I'm not saying this is like someone would just admit that that was their worldview, but it's a very therapeutic mindset. And so, fill in the blanks with, you know, these are just some different categories. Obviously, God is a holy trinity, okay? But I wanted you to just keep in mind, what often worldviews lack, apart from the, really the Christian religion, is an external word of judgment that resonates deep within the conscience and our experience that addresses guilt and shame and brokenness. Big time! And then a word of grace. It doesn't just like leave you there in your ruin or speculation, or for experience, or on the, on the treadmill of morality. Like the thing about the grace of the gospel is speculation. No, God, no one's seen God at any time. Remember, I read that at the very beginning of the class. The only God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has made Him known. There's Jesus. The way of morality, actually you can't get there. Boom, He comes to you. And the, and the way of, of experience, well, t- take what you can get when you come to the Savior, which is you know, the best, truest form of our, our humanity. Any comments or questions about those? No external word of judgment or grace. Keep, keep that in mind. Go ahead. Uh, what I'm finding nowadays, uh, <clears throat> I'm reading about this, um, people, they, they have their own individual ideas about God, you know, I'm, I'm the center and so forth, but if it's spread to the only source of truth is my experience. And because you have never had my experience, you can't tell me what to do. There's no objective truth. It's all my truth. My experience is the only truth. And um, if you have not had my experiences, you can't possibly understand. Yeah, it's a good point. And, and that comes down to um, certainly authority. Exactly. Right? Um, and there is some truth to you know, we want to walk in another's shoes, but we can never exhaustively comprehend their life experience, their trauma, um, shame they may carry, or great gifts and talents that they have. That's theirs. You know, that's, that's theirs in a sense to carry. But I think the, the norming norm of the Christian faith will say to them that, well, I, you know, actually, I, I do know that you're created in the image of God. Whether you acknowledge that or not, in great dignity... With the body, I see your body. I can't see your soul. I don't know your experience, but you've been given a mind and um, that can reason and judge and and chew a will that can do good, affections that feel all sorts of things, some good, bad, ugly. Right? You get it. So when I'm not, my point is, it's an aspect of authority, and there's so much. Um, it's called an antithesis, right? As it relates to what we worship. And the ultimate aims of our life, we love God. But then there's a lot of commonality that we have with people. Been, we're sinners and we're sinned against. Maybe they don't use those terms. But the Christian faith, boy, you can start with creation. You don't believe it? That's okay. Of course you don't. Scripture says you won't. Right? And so let me tell you how you may be able to, if it resonates with you. Sin, forgiveness, talk about yourself. And here's my experience. You know? I, I mean, it's not that easy when you're talking to someone. You have to love them and listen. But... Don't forget the the great cachet of divine revelation that we have to draw upon, especially creation. 
in the image of God with dignity. And, and certainly sin, we're all, uh, Pastor, you made a good point years ago, that we're all victims of sin and victimizers. And, and that kind of experience will just see themselves as a victim rather than, you know, victimizer. Like, what have they done? Like, that word of judgment, like, levels the playing field. Boom! Remember John the Baptist? He's going to make what? He's going to prepare the way of the Lord. How does he do it? Sinners repent, right? Boom! That, like, levels it. Super easy for the Savior to come and do the good works of the kingdom and the good news of the gospel when people are realizing what? They're sinful, right? And so that word of judgment... When you think of who God is, well, he's authority. You touched on a great point, which I, judgment and grace. Who has authority to issue judgment or to deliver grace? And the thing is, God does. But then what do we do as his, those in his image, as those redeemed in Christ? Great privilege to be able to do that as the Lord allows. Uh, go ahead, Barry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any, any, I mean, I gave you a bunch of different categories for God. When, when you're talking to people, it's good to think in those categories, authority, judgment, and grace. Obviously, I've done classes on worldview, creation, fall, redemption, consummation. How do we get here? What went wrong? How can things be made right? To what end are we made? You know, problem, solution, that kind of stuff. But when, when it comes to these different views of God, like just keep in mind, real simple, External word of judgment, external word of grace. Who has authority, to Sylvia's point, to deliver those? Only God. So even though the atheist, there's no God who exists, the panentheist, God is in everything. No creator-creature distinction. Hey, no creator at all. They're, they're very similar and they don't have an external word of judgment that'll judge you in your sin, but then not just leave you there, is assure you of grace and forgiveness and mercy. So any comments or questions about those categories before we move on to some of God's attributes. I, I missed something. Can yes. Question? Yeah. Now, what exactly is the difference between pantheism and pantheism? Oh, pantheism is God is everything. No creator creature distinction. Panentheism is God is in it. It's like shot through, like divinity shot through. You know how you put like water in a sponge? Ah, I see. You know, the water's not the sponge, the sponge is not the water, but you know, it's all shot through. Like that's like divinity. And that's a very common common view today because you see where people go to look for truth um, is where? Within, right? They try to connect with the divine within. Um, let's, let's look at this weird language our confession uses. When you look in number one, it talks about God's infinite in being and perfection, a most pure spirit, invisible, without body parts or passions. Let's talk about the with, without body parts. Kind of a weird Weird one. It's called uh, the doctrine of uh, simplicity. Um, divine simplicity. Did you want to add something, Jesse? Please. Say it louder so all the class can understand. I'm open to, yeah. No, no, I'm just saying it's invisible, comma, without body, comma, parts. Yeah, without body. Parts. That means he's, you know, without body, he's not corporal, he's spiritual. And then parts. The divine, go ahead, Larry, jump on in. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get my, wrap my head around without body. Jesus is God, Jesus had a body. So are they talking about the Father only, or why does it seem to be confusing? Yeah, they're talking about the divine essence. The eternal Father, the eternal begotten Son, and the Spirit who proceeds from the eternal Father and Son all co-equal in divinity and essence. So it's not talking about uh, the incarnation, which, of course, the body of Christ, even though he's a divine person, takes to himself human nature. Human nature, which is created, corporal. Uh, sits, he sits down by a well. He, he's crucified and buried and die, subject to change, according to his humanity. Follow up, though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Still remains the son, his divine nature. And a human still remains human. A 
because they're one person. So when it comes to these incommunicable attributes, like those, um, those, those would be things, obviously, that God doesn't, in a sense, share with us, right? He's, he's infinite and eternal. What else? No parts. Do you have parts? Yeah, there's things that constitute us, right? What are they? Body and soul, right? And those things are created. Created by God. God isn't created by anything. Here's, here's a couple of good quotes. Basically, the, the doctrine of divine simplicity is, is um, it's been said that it's the most fundamental doctrinal grammar of divinity. First time you're hearing about it. Like when we think simplicity, we think like simple to understand or comprehend. God's not necessarily simple to understand or comprehend. It doesn't mean that God's simple or easy. Theology is very complex at times. But when you think of, uh, and a good example is, of course, hydrogen, two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. What does that make up? You guys know that, right? If it's liquid, it's water, right? And, and if you remove the oxygen, is it still water? It's a compound. There's nothing that makes it, when we think of God's attributes, you think of his holiness, justice, goodness, truth, eternal. These are not different like, oh, that's one part of God's goodness is here. His wrath's there. His justice is there. Like God's essence is identical with his existence. God is identical with his existence and his essence. His existence and his essence are identical with one another. God isn't never divinity. He is divinity itself. And so the summary statement, all that is in God is God. Does that make sense? Now, why do we make distinctions between love and omnipresence and omnipotence and mercy well, because God's accommodated to reveal Himself to us with these... And one, one good thing is, as we get to this is... Um, we use analogical language to talk about God. And we'll touch on this in a little bit. But the main principle is all that is in God is God. Each of God's attributes, when you think of his attributes, can you see, can you see them naming them there in uh, Westminster Confession of Faith 2.1? Let's look at some of them. Immutable, you know what that means? Doesn't change, right? Immense is basically, that's just his immensity. He's everywhere present. Eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, most wise, most holy, free, most absolute. And then it talks about kind of his, his will, Working all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will for his own glory. And then here we get into some of these communicable attributes. These are things that, that we, in a sense, um, share with God. Maybe that's not the best way to say it. But things that, um, that we have a similitude to. When you say, Elder Bruce is good and God is good. Are they both good in the same way? No, but we do have, we do have an understanding as it relates to analogy, you can really go bad theologically. And of course, skeptics go bad because they say, well, how could God even make himself known in a way that you can understand? And they assume language is, of course, um, equivocity. No dissimilarity at all. Complete dissimilarity. Equivocity. No, it's a fancy word. The point is, listen, people who think one-to-one -one when you make God in your image. Well, God is good and God is loving. What does it mean when I'm good and I'm loving? Therefore, God is like that. Does that make sense? That's a bad thing. You don't want to use these communicable attributes and one-to-one -one map them on God. Because as we love, what do we do? Well, we give and then we receive and then we're changed and we accommodate ourselves. And God doesn't change. And of course, the main um, gripe against this view of the scriptures and the way that God reveals his attributes, both incommunicable and communicable, is that, well, if God is simple, then he, he can't really change. How can he enter into loving, legitimate relationships with creation? That requires, you know, change and reciprocity and mutability and ability to be changed by what you love. Otherwise, it's not real love. You follow what I'm saying? And so we want to make the point, it's not univocal language, one-to-one, good-good, love-love, mercy-mercy. 
It's analogical, which means it's, it's more, you know, there's similarity there, but certainly dissimilarity because of that fancy creator-creature distinction. Now, what we have in Scripture, though, are these accommodated, Calvin likens it to, you ever seen a mother with a newborn baby? Ooh, right? The baby knows his mommy loves it, and it's, it's loving, not noise. Like he says, we have, this is like God lisping to us. But these are authorized, accommodated analogies that truly reveal God. So when it says that no one has ever seen God at any time, the only God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has made Him known. John 1.18, right? And then what we have is, of course, this great apostolic, spirit-inspired uh, reflection and revelation of the Savior that is divinely authorized. And so once, once you grasp that, we have these divinely authorized, accommodated analogies that make God known truly good, merciful, you know, wrath, just, incomprehensible, eternal, unchangeable. All the, all the wild language. You know, remember the psalmist says, if I could go down into Sheol, you're there. If I go on the wings of the dawn up to the depths, you're there, right? I can't get away from you. Like, well, God's omnipresent. We make deductions based on all this revelation. So it's not like if you're reading the Confession of Faith, you're like, Where's that paragraph, verse there? No, what they're doing is drawing on the sum and substance of Scripture and then crystallizing it, going back and forth in a committee and saying, you know, here, here it is, and go chase it down for yourself. Go ahead, Larry, jump on in. Question <clears throat> on a one-on-one. Um, does God love us more when we're obedient? And love us less when we're disobedient? Would that be a change of God? I guess the, the best way I've, I've understood this is, is kind of skipping ahead. If you listen to this great line, God doesn't change. I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I will not give to another. I am the Lord, I do not change. Right? You see all these great passages in Micah. Does He love us more or love us less? Like God is eternally loved us by choosing us in His beloved Son with whom He is well pleased. And He's well pleased with us. Now, does the Spirit grieve? When we sin, right? You see that? Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Oh, wow. Can I grieve the Spirit? Yes. But that gets to, the, to one of these incommunicable attributes of impassibility that I want to touch on. So when you think of it, God doesn't need to experience a change um, or relation in order to meaningfully relate Himself to His creatures. I think that's really important to know. All that God does is ordain a change in the revelation of His unchanging being in accordance with His wisdom to the needs and requirements of the creature. Does that make sense? God is who He is eternally in all of His incommunicable and communicable attributes. And so, when you're convicted of sin by the Spirit, does that mean God is only uh, fatherly chastisement towards you? Right. Is that, is that all he is? Like, what's happened? Is that some change in God to where I went from being on his good, loving side to now I'm being chastised and convicted? And you know, like Hebrews 13 says, you know, if you're without discipline, you're illegitimate children, right? So what's happened there is I've gone from, you know, on cloud nine and communion with God, stumbled in sin, and now I'm feeling his fatherly chastisement. Like, obviously, we know we're not under the wrath and condemnation of God because of our precious Savior. Boom, cross, right? Go ahead and jump in. Let's keep talking about this. You're super holy. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Your kid, Stephen, must have been a great son. No, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I was a great kid. I had two great kids who didn't get into too much trouble. Yeah, I mean, sometimes we can gnash our teeth at our kids like the best. Oh, I love you. You know, well, yeah, you do love me, but you know, don't miss this. This God doesn't change in and of Himself ever. He does not change. He is who He is, infinite, eternal, and changing in His being, wisdom, knowledge, holiness, goodness, justice, and power, and every other attribute you can pull off the pages of Scripture. So, 
the, the example there, does he you know, love more or less? Uh, maybe I butchered your question. My, my point is, okay, let's say you've gone from a super great holy week in love, joy, communion with God, and then you stumbled headlong in sin. I don't know what it was, okay? And then you're feeling grief and chastisement, a little bit of shame and guilt, which is you know, your own doing, right? Has God turned his face towards you? Or has he turned his face away from you? Is he, is he, are you unloving? Are you out of his good graces? Well, no, because our theology is super good. We know we're forgiven and we're right with God. We have the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. All our sins were reckoned on Christ. So we don't need to try to atone for our sins by our feelings. And yet the fatherly chastisement hand of mercy, according to Hebrews, is pretty severe and not feeling all too great. So is that all God is toward us? Like what's happened? God's ordained a change in the revelation of his unchanging being in accordance with his wisdom. When you think of God's knowledge, he knows all things, all things, everything, every single thing. The the language of God's wisdom, at least for some of the medieval Protestant reformers, was God's ordering of all things according to their end. Not that he doesn't know that and do that with his knowledge, but the wisdom was this most holy, wise, uh, preserving and ordering all things to most holy ends. And when you think of the most holy ends that you're ordained to, is Christ-likeness. So that chastisement that you feel, or that fatherly uh, correction, is, is the reality of God ordaining from all eternity a change in the revelation of His unchanging being in accordance with His wisdom. Why? Because of the needs and, and I guess, the requirements of the creature. What is it that you need? What is required of God's character to be revealed to you in order to accomplish God's most holy ends? It doesn't mean God is, oh, i got to do this now. Oh, i got to do that. No, that's, that's bad, right? God's determined all things according to the counsel of his will and decreed everything that will ever come to pass, and yet we have this, this great liberty and freedom of will. Did you guys totally get lost? This is like PhD stuff. You know, these guys in, in the confession, they're animals. So I don't expect you just to get it. The main thing you need to be rocking away from is that, okay, don't look within for revelation, right? And then realize you have these authorized, accommodated analogies that truly reveal God, not exhaustively. Remember the Charnock Charnock quote. I'm going to go back to that if I could ever find it, and then we'll let someone else jump in. The Charnock quote, though we cannot comprehend him as he is, we must be careful not to fancy him to be what he is not. So, when he's, when he's ordained a change in the revelation of his being to meet the circumstances of our life, it's not that God's changing. But the accent of what's being revealed and made known to us and impressed upon our conscience or with the great comfort of the gospel, it's not that God changed, it's just that he's revealed himself in a way to glorify himself and to benefit us to his most holy ends. It's so beautiful. And if, if you don't get that, then you think that God is is changing and calling like, like those NFL quarterbacks when a blitz is coming. Oh no, they did this. I got to call a hot route. I got to call an audible. We got to get out of this play. And he's always reacting and like pivoting. That's phony baloney. You, you want to jump in and then bury. The um, most we should derive from that is security in God and changing God for it. So beautifully said. Like... When, when you think of one of the most beautiful things about God, remember in Acts 17, 25, he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything, right? Romans eleven thirty five. 35, who has first given him that he should be repaid? Like we don't give God, that God we don't give God that then God owes us. Job's full of it. Like Daniel 4, no, no one can stay your hand or say, what have you done? God is utterly independent. Not in need, has life in himself. Is the giver, James says, of what? Every good and, and perfect or completing gift, like it comes from above. It's so beautiful. God is the giver. And, and you know, we're so filled with pride, we tend to think that, well, you know, let me just give to you, God. And then, you know what, God, I did all this for you. you I, I owe to be received this, right? And then we can get a fall afoul of being presumptuous rather than certainly be presumptuous of his promises, in a kind of careful way. I say that like facetiously, right? All his promises are yes and amen in Christ, right? Be patient in their fulfillment because some of them have yet to be fulfilled. New heavens, new earth, all the healing of your tears and your, your, the evil that you experience in your bodies. 
Like, that's yet to be fulfilled. Um, you want to jump in, though, Barry? Oh, that's so great, right? And, and what he's doing and, and, and revealing the aspect of his character, <laughs> they should be consumed because of their sin. But God has, has entered into a covenant with them and bound himself to them because of his covenant promise and his promise to do good to his people. And therefore, we're not consumed. And so w- when it comes back to your point, how it should bring us great comfort, not just that God's done these old, of course, new covenants in Christ by the blood of Christ, like that, that our favor with God is sealed by the shed blood of the Savior. And that God's grace to us by the Holy Spirit, of course, has shed abroad the love of God in our hearts, and therefore we truly love God and love others properly. That God will never change. He'll never fail to be faithful to us. He'll never fail to keep us to the very end. Though difficult is the way that leads to life, Right? Through many persecutions, we must enter the kingdom of heaven. Though all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Do you know who's sovereign over it all, who's loving over it all, and who's working his most holy ends over it? Yes, God. Unchangingly for you in and of himself doesn't change. So when you think of immutable, we tend to think that that means he doesn't change. Like he's immobile like a post. (laughs) He's just there, and then your relationship to the post changes based on you. No, like he he is... um, in the plenitude and fullness of His life and His inner Trinitarian love and holiness. That is who He is, ever active according to His nature. Always. And it's so majestic. You can rest in that. You can bask in that. You can reflect on it. The confession does a decent job. Reading Scripture and then meditating upon to the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God be honor and glory forever and ever. I mean, you read a passage like that and you're like, okay, I, you know, immortal, invisible, only God. That means you're not God, right? Okay? And, and then be honor and glory. Okay, that means to God be honor. That's what I should be doing, giving Him honor and glory for, and not to me, O oh Lord, not to us, O oh Lord, right? Psalm 115. He gets that hundreds of years earlier. But to your name give the glory. Why, psalmist? For the sake of, sake of your steadfast love and faithfulness. And that steadfast love in the Hebrew, we're going to close here. Chesed. (laughs) Like covenant faithfulness. Covenant loyalty. Back to Barry's point. Like because he's bound himself to us in the covenant and of course in the incarnation in a sense. Like we're never going to be put to shame. And we have an eternal hope. And so we just touched on the beginnings of obviously God the Holy Trinity. My main points I wanted to drive home. Simplicity. Okay. That just means God's existence and His essence, they're one. I think back to the point of analogical language, don't forget that. And then these incommunicable attributes, like it's so glorious that God doesn't change that He's eternally and everlastingly for you. No matter what happens, like if, if, you, if you feel like, you know, remember the psalmist says, um, he's kind of begging God not to turn His face away or turn, your, turn me to you and I'll be turned. Like the, the main point is God is only ordaining a change in the revelation of His unchanging being in accordance with His wisdom. And to basically accommodate Himself in that way uh, to meet the needs and requirements of the creature. And, and therefore, He's not changing at all, but, but really your, your glimpse. Like it's a prism of the, the, the effulgent plenitude of who God is. And little rainbow colors are being shot through based on where you are in your life. You know, you're going to go hear the gospel. You're going to see your b- baptism. You're going to reflect on your own baptism. You're going to come to the table and you're going to be like, wow, God. You're going to hear a certain sermon and words from Isaiah and God's going to drive those home to you about his character. And he's not changing like, oh, let me meet this person, this person. You know, he's just revealing the, the fullness of who he is. And God's people are just to bask in that and then respond to that and give him glory. And it's very um, mysterious. And, and glorious. You can rest on that. So, any comments or questions where time is full? Go ahead. We're changing. We're going through sanctification. Right? So it's not that he's changing, we're changing. We, we know him better as we go through whatever those trials are and we see him work in our life. And we thank God he's, he's mm-hmm. working on us and not letting us you know, live the way that our sinful nature wants us to live. You know? Yeah. That's, that's the thing. Yeah, and, and the, one of the biggest challenges is when our, our good intentions 
will of God intentions are, are thwarted. And we can be like, you know, how could you, God? This was the will of God. This was my desire. This was best for your kingdom. <laughs> God knows what's best. And he's worthy to be trusted. Um, let us pray. Father, thank you for you, the Lord, do not change. Um, we are ever changing, as Elder Bruce said, and ever in need of, of you continuing to not just reveal yourself, you've revealed yourself in the gospel in Holy Scripture, but illumine our minds and our hearts to who you truly are, uh, your character and your beauty. Uh, may we reflect upon it in your sanctuary this day. May we hear of it yet again and, and see it in the sacraments. And by your Spirit, may we be ever conformed into the image of Christ, our, our Savior, the head of this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.